everybody. Hi. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to EM Chats. I'm Jessica Heasley coming to you live from Event Marketer Headquarters in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, in just a minute, we'll get started with today's chat on Taming the Wireless Network. But first, a quick rundown on how EM Chats work. Our expert panelist has come today with a few tips that he's going to present in the first 10 or 15 minutes. And then for the second 15 minutes, we'll go face to face for some Q&A. Um, feel free to submit your questions at any time using the chat function in the lower right of your screen, and we'll be answering those in real time. Uh, you can also click on the people icon, which is also in the lower right of your screen, and that brings the video to full screen. Um, before we get started, we would like to take a few seconds to introduce you to today's sponsor. Brown Pelican Group specializes in providing Wi-Fi and technology for events. With over 15 years in the events industry, they understand that the event attendee experience can make or break an event. If attendees can't get connected, they can't engage in your brand. Brown Pelican Group excels at providing custom solutions to meet your needs and your budget. Thank you to Brown Pelican Group. All right, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our industry expert for today's chat. John O'Gara is the Group Manager of Event Technology at Microsoft, and today he's going to share his picks for five ways that you can tame the wireless network at your next event. Welcome, John, and take it away. Hey, John. Oh, can we hear you? I'm not sure. That, can, can anybody, anybody have a hard time hearing John? I was going to say, I don't hear him. Okay. John, did you, uh, John, try star seven on your phone. Let's try that again. There, did that work? There we go. We got you. Excellent. All right. It's always the star seven. Um, so I've got a uh, some slides here to go through really quick to kind of start things off. Are you guys able to see those? Are you guys able to see the slides okay? Yep, we can see them, John. Great, outstanding. So uh, basically when we look at doing event wireless, we think of five different pillars or five different areas that we focus on. The are uh, event goals, the venue, the people, a trusted advisor, and the expectation setting that's done around the event and the offering that you're doing with Wi-Fi. Um, when I look at event goals, I basically want to point out that a lot of times we get focused on our goals uh, we want to have social exposure. We want to have PR opportunity. Uh, we want people to use various services that we've put together in order to do evaluations, feedback, et cetera. Um, but it's really important to pay attention as well to the attendees' goals for that kind of uh, for the wireless experience. Um, they want to stay connected with work and home while they're at the event. That's possibly the most common thing we see. Um, they want to be able to pay attention to messaging that's been given at the event and they want to f learn a little bit more about it and dive in. They want to be social. They want to share with the community what they're doing at the event, uh, et cetera. And another area that they like to do is they want to do location mapping, wayfinding. They want to find out where the nearest Starbucks is or whatever. Um, second area, area that we pay attention to is once we've kind of thought about what our goals are as well as what the goals for the attendees are is the venue. And uh, I really feel that visits to the venue and digging in with the venue for your event prior to the event are critical. Um, some areas that seem obvious, but do they provide wireless and how do they provide it? Um, how are they set up to do it? How is their in-house support? Some venues that doesn't make financial sense to have uh, a dedicated staff member or a dedicated team and they outsource the whole thing. So everything is done via a phone number and somebody trying to remotely troubleshoot the issues. Um, that can work, but it's not as successful as we'd all like it to be. Um, I always ask for references. Who else has used the wireless here? What events have used it that are of the same size of audience, same type of audience, same demands? Uh, one of the questions we always ask, we typically replace everything uh, when we do an event. So we'll, one of our big questions is, can you shut down the equipment in the venue if we want to bring in our own equipment? Um, and finally, yeah, go ahead. If 
finally, one of the things that we'll look at is if you can't address the uh, issues that you have with the venue or that the venue doesn't seem like it's going to meet your needs in the wireless space and wireless is critically important to you for the event, then you might need to find a new venue. Now, clearly that depends on where the prioritization is of the wireless needs, but it's something that should be considered if it's a very high priority. The other thing we'll look at typically is the people. How will, how will our attendees use the wireless network? Um, how many of them do we expect to have at the event, and how many will be online at any given time? At Microsoft, our typical event load is between 25 and 50% of the attendees at the event actually using the wireless at any given time. Uh, we will look at where will they be, you know, where are we providing wireless, where do we expect the load to be generated from, where will people be. Um, we look at the type of users. We have events with developers, for example, that will have, be higher consumers of wireless usage than our sales or partner events where we will typically see lower, uh, comparatively speaking, lower usage. So you need to know kind of what type of users do you have at your events and what are they expected to do. Um, what do they expect? Do they expect to be able to stream live video from your event out to a website that they maybe have or maintain uh, to share with the community live what's going on at your event? Uh, that certainly is a lot more of an intensive use by that attendee type than somebody that's just trying to keep up with their email, email and such while they are away from the office. Um, the other thing that we always take it pay a good attention to is you may build a network that handles building wide all of the people you plan on bringing to the event. The challenge you can run into is if you uh, if everybody gets out of one room and they're on one end of the building, suddenly you don't have an even distribution. So you were totally set up fine for how it might be in the afternoon during breakout sessions, but when everybody starts the day in one location and then fans out from there, the beginning of the day might be a little hectic, and it's something that's really worth paying attention to. The next thing that we look for, and it's not always an option for every company and for every event, obviously, but it's something that we try to always find on any size of our event that we do, is we work with a trusted advisor. And basically, I define that person as the person that's better at wireless than I am. They understand it better. They know more about it. They're the person who teaches me what works and what doesn't work. Um, there's an awful lot of folks that are out there that do that. There's a lot of people that claim to do event wireless. Um, you really need to find somebody that has experience with the type of venue you're in and the size and scale of your event. If they've never done anything as big as your event, they probably are going to have a hard time because they're going to have to do some learning. If your event fits right in with the size and the capabilities that you're looking for, for what they've done in the past, then you're likely to have a good experience. Um, it's, all, it's very important when you're talking to people that are offering to help you with your wireless, whether it's in-house people at the venue or a third-party company that you bring in, to ignore the sales pitch and make sure that you're working with somebody who's actually an engineer and is, understands the technology that they're deploying. Uh, oftentimes we find the sales pitch is, absolutely, we've done that before, we can do it again, not a problem. And We've all probably been there with any kind of thing, catering, signage, staging, production, uh, networking. Uh, any element of a live event will clearly fall into that pitfall where they've been over-promised and under-delivered. So it's important to get past the sales pitch and talk to somebody. Um, one of the key ways that I see to like validate if you've got the right people involved is go to one of their events. Ask them, hey, I've got a 500-person or a 1,000-person or a 5,000-person event. When do you have one, something similar to that coming up? Uh, and get in touch with them and go to that event and be there during setup and during the event so that you can sit with them and watch how do they handle issues, how do they triage problems, and how do they go after resolution. It's a critical piece of seeing how they actually work and, and to demonstrate how they will work on your event. The next thing that we look at is expectations, and I kind of group expectation setting into three different buckets. Um, clearly, you have attendees, but you also need to set expectations with the people that you report to or that have hired you to deliver on the event. Um, so you need to work with the event owner and the stakeholders. You need to understand what success looks like. I frequently set up success at like a 90% or an 85% satisfaction around wireless. 
because there's an awful lot of variables that you don't control. And because you can't control those variables, you can't successfully get to 100%. Um, uh -huh. So you've got to define what realistic satisfaction looks like and how things will work out. With the attendees, um, our, probably our most common challenge that we run into with attendees is they expect wireless somewhere that we have not planned for it. And they might even be able to see it from an adjacent area that we did plan for it. But because they can see it and we didn't engineer it for the space they're in, they try to connect and they have a bad experience. Um, we go way out of our way via Twitter, via printed material, via signage, via our website in advance of the event to explain to people where they will find wireless coverage. And we also try to point out to them how will it work? You know, what's the expectation? Like, can you live stream from it? Yes or no. Um, can you blog from it, do email, what's the intended use? And we'll tell them both where we have it, where we don't have it, if there's certain technology involved in the frequencies that are only able to be used in certain areas, we'll work with them to explain that in advance and to publish that as much as possible so that everybody's clear on the expectations. Um, finally, the last bucket of folks that I think often gets ignored is the of other event staff. So not the event owner and not the people doing the networking and the wireless, but the people that are actually just dealing with information. They're trying to tell people where sessions are and where to go from A to B to C. It's helpful for them to understand where it's laid out, how it's laid out, and how it works for folks so that they can kind of be an additional source of information to explain why it's not available here, why it is available there, et cetera. That's kind of the five pillars that we look at. I've got a slide up here that has some other tips, and this is something that even you know Microsoft with a very large budget to do our events, uh, some of these things we've gone ahead and done anyway, uh, where we've decided in some spots to do less coverage. In other words, if you can't be successful trying to do the whole event or cover every part of your event, I would suggest that it makes a lot of sense to define what you can do well publish it, set expectations, and then do it well. Instead of doing the entire first and second floor of a hotel meeting space, um, maybe just have a hotspot lounge on each floor. It's a smaller space. You can control it better. It'll be less expensive. Uh, you don't have to cover as many people because it's physically limited to how many people can get into that space. Uh, and just set expectations around that. Pick something that you're going to do and then do it well. Uh, there's two different technologies in wireless, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, and if interested, we can talk about that in Q&A time. But 2.4 gigahertz doesn't really support high density places. So one of the things that we've done and other conference leaders like South by Southwest and Cisco and others is to remove 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz from the high density areas and only offer it in areas that are lower density. Um, it's an older technology. It's not going to work very well anyway. Declare it dead. Don't offer it in certain spaces and move on. Um, we talked about communication. That's critical. Um, whatever you do in wireless, if you tell somebody they can flip the light switch and the lights will come on, you need to be able to deliver. So if you tell somebody there's wireless in a space, make sure you've done your best effort on that space. You know, Going back to do it, pick something you know you can do well and do it. Um, trusted advisors are critical. Um, certainly that's a budget issue, and it can be a challenge to find the trusted advisor if you've got a more limited budget, but it's really a critical piece of the delivery. Finally, this is one thing that a lot of people miss. Um, you need to have enough wired infrastructure and large enough circuits serving the building to make your wireless successful. If you finally win the wireless war and you are successful in getting everybody on wireless, um, but you don't have enough pipe to get them out of the building, you end up failing because you've got people on the highway, but the highway wasn't big enough. Um, so it's something to pay attention and make sure that you've sized things correctly for that. Finally, my last, my last tip is really simple. Um, live like an attendee. And what do I mean by that? Basically, I mean that at the event, the house staff, your trusted advisor, whoever you have engaged on paying attention to your wireless network, they see that everything's on, everything's working, everything seems fine. But they and you need to walk around your event with a variety of devices. You need to go around with phones. You need to go around with your tablets. You need to go around with laptops. Test the wireless in the spaces that you're in. There isn't a really good system to monitor the end user experience. You can monitor 
all kinds of elements of a wireless network, but the only real good way to monitor how it works for the end user is to go be an end user and live like an attendee at your own event and test out the wireless periodically throughout the day and give feedback to the people that are running it on where you found problems so that they can dig into it. So, Jessica, that's all I've got in the uh, in the in the uh, formal slides. So, uh, we wanted to invite everybody to join us next month. On August 15th, we are going to do another 30-minute chat. Um, Alex Sapiz, the Director of Sales, Partner Engagement, and Recognition at Cisco, is going to be joining us to talk about women in events. Um, they're going to tackle the subject of uh, sharing their lessons learned, their best advice, and what they think about leaning in, breaking the glass ceiling, and being a female in the world of events. Uh, before we go, we would like to give one more shout out to today's sponsor. Brown Pelican Group is proud to have sponsored this EM chat. Thank you for coming. And please check them out at brownpelicangroup.com. Our special thanks again to John O'Gara, and thank you all for chatting with us today. We'll see you next time.